Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, it's good to see you here. Um, my name is Antonis Danos, for those of you who are only joining this three-day conference, and we've reached uh, the finale of the conference, which I'm confident is going to be uh, a, a grand finale. Um, those of you who are here with us um, on Friday, we had an um, intriguing, exciting, and entertaining talk by Professor Spivak. I'm sure we have something uh, equivalent, if not even greater tonight, with uh, Mr. Tariq Ali. Um, and, uh, uh, I'll pass on the microphone to Shreko Horvat, who's going to do the introduction uh, for Mr. Uh, Ali. So, Shreko, over to you. Oh, uh, sorry, yes, I, I forgot about the buffet. Yes, of course, yes. Yes, oh, Shreko, I wanted to tell you, of course, that after the talk and the question and answers session, we have a buffet right to the space next to this, so please don't go away. You know, worth the uh, food for you, so stick around. Thank you. Thanks for the int introduction. Uh, I will be the moderator of tonight's distinguished keynote lecture. And also I would like to thank uh, the Cyprus University of Technology, Nim, Elen, Yanis, Nicolas, Maria, and all others who were involved. I, I was very glad to be the last three days uh, in Cyprus, and I hope Tariq as well. Uh, on Friday, we even had a chance to go together to Nicosia and to Famagusta to see also the part uh, of Varosha. And I think Tariq will tell you something about that as well. The last time we were together, uh, Tariq had a lecture in Zagreb under the title The Rotten Heart of Europe. Uh, today, the title of his lecture is The Future of Europe. I don't know if it means that he turned optimistic in the meantime, but we will hear it. Uh, and. I don't think there is need for much presentation of Tariq Ali, but nevertheless I will tell just a few sentences. As you probably know, Tariq Ali is one of the most prominent British Pakistani leftists uh, in the world today. Uh, he was called the street fighting man during the 60s, but I think he stayed the street fighting man also in his 60s and 70s. Uh, he's the author of uh, more than 30 books, uh, history books, but also novels. Uh, Tariq Ali is also a novelist, a filmmaker. Among the theory or pro polit political, political books, uh, he published Clash of Fundamentalisms, uh, The Obama Syndrome, which was, I think, published in Greece. Uh, and last but not least, uh, I think without Tariq Ali, the territory of the contemporary left would be completely different uh, because he, is one, uh, he, he was one of the founders of the New Left Review and he's a very important person in the publishing house Versa as well, who, which publishes uh, the most important leftist books today. Uh, so this is all. I won't take the floor anymore. I think we have one hour for the lecture, and then we will have um, even more than 40 minutes uh, for a Q&A, debate, discussion, and so on. So please, a big applause for Tariq. Uh, <clears throat> dear friends, I'm very happy to be uh, in Cyprus. Uh, it's a country I've never visited before, though I have read about it a great deal. And of course, as you know, London is one of the centers, big centers of the Cypriot population, both Greek and Turkish. So we have had contacts over the years with many leftists from Cyprus, from both communities. What I want to talk about today, I, Shrechko jokingly mentioned the future of Europe, but the difference between the title of the talk in Zagreb, The Rotten Heart of Europe, and the title of this talk, The Future of Europe, they are closely interrelated. So it's not that I've become optimistic since I was in Zagreb. I think, if anything, the situation is even worse. Uh, there is not a single European country now which has not been affected by the Wall Street crash of 2008. Not a single European country. Some are managing a bit better than others, but the force field of this economic crisis extends through the whole of Europe, and of course not just Europe, but North America, the Arab world, and the world beyond. No one is immune to it. And that is why it's extremely important to 
classify and category this crisis. What is it? It is not simply an uh, episodic crisis. It's quite a deep going crisis which is on the same level, though yet not with the same effects as yet, of the 1929 crash and the depressions that followed in the 1930s. Since that period, this is the first occasion where global capitalism, more global now than ever before, has witnessed a crisis of this kind. What is it? It's of course a capitalism which was changed and transformed in the 90s in most of the European countries, if not all, that in most of the European countries we had <clears throat> a process uh, which was pretty similar in the northern European countries and then slowly mimicked by the Mediterranean countries, which was the deindustrialization, all the big steel industries of Europe, in many sections of the car industries in Britain, the entire mining industry was decimated. And it was decimated not because it was necessary to decimate it, but the bourgeoisie, to use an old-fashioned word, was determined to change the structural basis of capital to weaken the workers' movement, to weaken the trade union organizations of this movement, to make the left irrelevant, and the time, of course, that was obviously important for them was the late 1980s and then the entire decade of the 90s. It is in this period that the new economic and political architecture of the world in which we live was built. So what was this architecture? First, large-scale privatizations. And in this talk I will have to generalize. It doesn't mean they happen everywhere in exactly the same way. But these were the trends and currents of this process. Neoliberal globalization meant large-scale privatizations, the entry of private capital into what had till now been the most hallowed domains of social provision and social welfare. Uh, and this is true, by the way, in most parts of the world now, not just Europe or America, this, this, this style of operation. Uh, and at the same time, large-scale creditism, credit, and encouraging the growth of debt, both on a national scale as far as countries are concerned, and on the level of individuals. Borrow, borrow, borrow for that is your future and you can all be rich and you can all consume because of course together with this came a consumerist culture uh, which was expressed in the MTV the, the music television channel in a memorable phrase which was the philosophy of this epoch in many ways for at least two decades, don't worry, be happy. Don't think all the thinking is being done for you. Don't panic because we have got everything under control. And this spread systematically in country after country backed by who did this you know people now talk and we will come to this point later but <clears throat> people talk of bankers as being the most evil people on earth well you know we can debate and discuss that the question is how did the bankers get the ability to operate like this without the permission of the state without the permission of the politicians directing the state, without the help of the state, they could not have done this. So don't say it was just the bankers. 
it was the politicians who made it possible for this system to come into being. And they were politicians from both the center-left and the center-right. And as I've been arguing now for a number of years, that this system had a political impact that if you create a system like this in which the fundamentals are the ownership of the means of production by private capital, the primacy of private capital, the denationalizing of state interests and state uh, uh, ownership via private capital, then what do politics, politicians and different parties argue about? If all the major political parties in a country agree that this is the way forward, then what is the price of democracy? And so the system that has been put into place from the 80s and 90s could, I think, with some accuracy, be defined as the dictatorship of capital. The form this dictatorship takes varies from country to country. In some countries it's more democratic, in other countries it's less democratic, but fundamentally now, in my opinion, capitalism and democracy are becoming incompatible. And it will be, ironically, up to the left and the social movements and the political movements and political parties of the left, which are not part of this uh, systemic shift, to argue in favor of democracy, of democratic rights, democratic accountability, and make democracy more meaningful, not less meaningful. And I'm going to give you now a classic case of this, which we have seen, the most startling case of this system and how it functions uh, uh, in Europe today. I mean, look at Greece, which is very close to, you know, you. Uh, in many ways, but if you look and study at what has been happening in Greece over the last years, decades, go into the European Union, join the Eurozone, massive credits are given out, the price of single, every single thing in Greece shoots up, houses which were prior to the changeover worth I don't know, let's say X, are now worth X multiplied by 10, multiplied by 15, multiplied by 20. It creates, in other words, a fake world within a bubble. It's not real, and yet everyone imagines it's real. And because credit is in plentiful supply, prices of houses go up, there's a housing bubble, Massive change in transport, public transport is denigrated, everyone is encouraged to buy a car. And by the way, I have seen more Mercedes, Benzes and Audis in, on this little island than I have anywhere for some time. And all, uh, I'm just wondering where this money is coming from. I mean, it can't just be the uh, laundry of the Russians. <coughs> It must be coming from somewhere else too, but anyway, we can uh, <clears throat> maybe, maybe discuss that later. Uh, so th this system, which is now then in place, and everyone is encouraged to believe, no problems at all. People are happy, people are, can borrow whatever they want, and people don't ask how long can this go on. And those people who do ask how long can this go on are told, why are you so pessimistic? You know, you people are dinosaurs. You live from the world of the past. Where you know, capitalism has surmounted its problems. If you look at the books that have been published in the last 25 years, I mean, a book by an otherwise quite intelligent uh, uh, columnist for the Financial Times, Martin Wolf, who knows how the, what's going wrong, but his big book was How Globalization Works. Just read it, or if you, you know, just look at it now, and it makes you laugh. The illusions of all these people. 
he was of course a more intelligent version I mention him for that reason but there were hundreds and hundreds of books pouring out of university presses all over the world saying how brilliant the system was and how it was working so well and coupled with this it produced what I call the politics of the extreme center people know about the extreme right its growth they know about the extreme left but very few people have analyzed the extreme center why do I call it extreme <clears throat> because in order to preserve power this extreme center will make war it will support the occupation of countries it will do what it's told by the United States or by the uh, representatives of the United States in Europe or any other part of the world and the differences within this extreme center are minimal I mean, what are the differences within politics today in most of Europe if the center right wins what changes what changes is a few sh shifts in culture which are not unimportant but not absolutely fundamental in terms of the way society is run uh, and what also changes of course is patronage clientelism so if the right is in center right is in power they make sure their people make money uh, and they themselves make money and if the center left is in power they behave in exactly the same way as we have seen over the last few years in Spain, in Italy, in Greece, to mention three countries. So what is happening in Greece <coughs> at the moment has brought all the things I've been saying to a head. You have a total crisis of the system, a total collapse, people living in grim conditions, in some parts of Greece in parts of towns certainly in the country on some of the islands uh, people are having to make ends meet in very very difficult conditions there have been three big general strikes there have been regional strikes and through this turbulence and turmoil a tiny party of the left suddenly grows because its leadership and its leader attracts attention and is quite a capable leader in terms of arguing against the extreme center and for a moment it appears that the extreme center might be defeated the real threat in the last Greek elections that Syriza under Cyprus might win the elections and they came close and what happens then? Then you see the European Union at its worst, but also at its most revealing. Every single head of state of the principal European countries appeals to the Greek people on television, whatever else you do, don't vote for Syriza. Your country will collapse, you will fail. A huge black propaganda campaign is mounted. If Syriza wins, there will be no medicines in the supermarket. If Syriza wins, you will be short of food. If Syriza, every worse, everything that can possibly happen to you will happen to you. Now, why? Because actually, on the ground, Syriza's program, in my opinion, was, you know, reasonable, but it was not that radical, leave alone extreme. What they said effectively was that they would reject the conditions being imposed on Greece by the Troika. And the rejections of these conditions was of course something unacceptable to the Troika and to the European Union elite. Unacceptable to them because of the space it would open up in Greece and the example it would create in other parts of Europe that you can defy the European Union, you can try and prepare an alternative which does not accept the neoliberal model, which does not accept what is being done. And, and you, I mean, the hysteria was unimaginable. 
the Financial Times in Germany published a whole page in Greek appealing to its Greek readers, of which I don't think there were too many, but who knows, not to allow the disaster of Syriza to fall upon Greece. Don't let it happen. It was tabloid journalism of the worst sort, creating fear and creating panic. I'm quite happy, actually, that this financial, German Financial Times has just collapsed. It's been closed down because not many Germans were buying it, leave alone Greeks. But this is, this is what it meant, and the entire press of Europe, the television networks, were on the same line. And so series are lost. But the statistics are very interesting that a large majority of people under 40 voted for them. It was the votes of the elderly that got the extreme center in power again. And that is good for the future. Extremely good in, in, in my opinion. And of course this pattern could be and probably will be repeated increasingly in other parts, in other parts uh, of the world. Because unless there are political alternatives, however imperfect, however much we might disagree with this or that aspect of them, when you have the creation of a mass movement which finds a political instrument that it can use, then in my opinion it borders on sectarianism and craziness not to understand and not to see that. And so there are important lessons to be learned because it's not over. They still are not doing what they promised to help their Greek collaborators, the Troika. So Greece is still in a complete mess. Spain, Italy, not far behind. And unless political alternatives can be found within these countries, there is another reaction which comes. There is the far right, which we will discuss a bit later, but there is also nationalism. So the gut reaction in Spain of the Basques and more the Catalans, the Catalonians, is, the, is to say, okay, <clears throat> this state can't function properly, we'll go it alone. But in fact, you can't go it alone, because all you're saying is that we want our own elite to negotiate directly with the, with the European Union. We don't want to go through Madrid. So it's not going it alone, it's effectively saying we don't want to share anything with Madrid and we will be part of the European Union, so what's the difference? So what if the European Union says to you, no? We will not accept you as new members. We are uh, putting a freeze on membership, which is effectively what they've done with the exception of Croatia, which they can't retreat from. They're not going to take on any new countries. So then what will the Catalans do? The same question in Scotland, in Britain. The Scots say whether they will go the way, but in two years there's a referendum whether Scotland should be independent or not. Who knows what will happen? It, a lot will depend on the political and economic situation in Britain as a whole under this uh, coalition government. But here again, they're faced with the same problem. And the question is this, and in Scotland it's become a huge debate. The Scottish National Party, in order to make sure it gets into Europe, is making concession after concession after concession to the EU bureaucracy. The position of this party was, if we join, uh, when we are independent, there will be no nuclear weapons on Scottish soil and we will withdraw from NATO. In earlier days, some of their leaders used to say, and we will be a democratic modern republic. Now they are saying they won't, you know, the Queen can be Queen of Scotland. Now they are saying they'll be members of NATO. Tomorrow, and they are not saying whether they will go into the Eurozone or not, they'll, they would prefer to be tied to the pound. So then the question rises, what's the point? 
it's one thing if you say we want our own space to make it completely different or to use it for something new. <clears throat> but if all you want to be is a smaller version of what you're leaving, then many Scots people will say, what's the point if we're going to be exactly the same? So I'm not at all sure that this will take off, but there are many others on the Scottish left who are arguing at least we'll have our own space to fight for, and so even if we don't agree with the SNP, we can fight them within Scottish space. Fair enough, but I mean, that is the position of the Scottish left. But whether the mass of Scottish people will go along with that, I don't know. So this new uh, rise of, of national identity as a way of dealing with the crisis is not on its own effective because it's not going to work unless you have a social and political and economic program which is different and the Scots leadership the nationalist leadership is saying we will accept the compact of 1945 which is a social democratic state but the EU laws don't allow you to do that anymore unless you really fight them so are you going to fight them, in which case why bother applying for EU membership? Do you see there are all these contradictions which have not been, which have not been uh, uh, sorted out? So the economic crisis is having a political impact uh, which we are all living through now. In your own country there is a huge crisis of the banking system. And here you have the second big contradiction of the system that the ideology of this system says the state has to be sidelined the state has to be marginalized the state should no longer intervene to help the poor to create cheap housing to own the health system or the transport system or anything like that it is impermissible and it is wrong the market will determine all this but what if the market collapses as it has done then all these ideologues who have been arguing against the state anti-statist stuff and the bankers and the neoliberals go on their knees before the state and say state please help us don't let our banks collapse and the state pours in trillions and trillions of dollars to prevent the banks from collapsing the same state which says we shouldn't be spending money on social welfare systems or maintaining the same level of social welfare is spending trillions on making sure that the banks don't go under. Now, you know, the argument is not that all the banks should have gone under because it's not the speculators or those who use the banks for money laundering that I'm, I worry about, or those who have spirited their funds out of their own country so they don't have to pay taxes. All these are common things now within the European banking system, not just in Switzerland or Cyprus, elsewhere too. The whole banking system is infected. But the choice now is that when, the, I mean, to give you a concrete example, in Britain, the Royal Bank of Scotland, the largest bank in the country, is 90% owned by the, by the state. But they don't like to admit it. Because to admit it means actually going against their own ideology because the state is not permitted to do this. So they are allowing the bank to operate as a private institution whereas it is owned and controlled by the state. No. And this is their problem. So it would be much better actually to have one or two state-owned, large state-owned banks which do not function as private banks, which actually help where help is needed and for the rest of the banks quite honestly the sooner they collapse the let them go let them bleed why keep them going i mean they're parasitical in many in many cases what's the problem and the problem is of course that if they let them go as the market rules 
and market ideology suggests that they should, then they are extremely scared that this whole basis of the neoliberal system, which is based on expanding credit, will collapse and they have no alternatives at all. Now, the comparison with the 2930s crisis, which is sometimes made, is interesting. Two things which are important. One, that during the crisis of the late 20s and 30s, when what we call is capitalism took, if you like, slowly and gradually, and institutionalized it after the Second World War, they took a social democratic road. Mass Keynesian economics, massive state projects, including in the United States of America. Still, that you know, put a massive stimuli into the economy did not work. And a new depression was beginning to be seen when the Second World War broke out. It was the Second World War and massive spending on military expenditure that actually rescued the American economy. That's what did it, the combination of the two, with the war playing an extremely important role in reviving the economy for the United States. Today, of course, the military in the United States is, is, is extremely strong. The spending on it, largely state money, which goes to sustaining it, helps to keep part of the American economy going. But on its own, they can't carry on indefinitely. Uh, at this rate, unless something productive is being done as well. And that explains partially, not completely, the desire to make sure that U.S. hegemony over the world is, is kept and, uh, and maintained. Why? Because in the 20s and 30s it was a different world order. For good or for bad, you had the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was not discredited at that time, but was seen by millions of people as an alternative. And the capitalist system felt that they had to do something because if they, if they didn't, working class consciousness in their own country would increase and people would look in that direction. This is now not even a secret. Many uh, right-wing historians even acknowledge this fact. So the reason for the social democratic turn within capitalism was not just a function of the internal dynamics of the system, but of the external world situation. And after the Second World War, this was even more decisive. When the Cold War divided Europe and the world, revolutions were happening in China, Vietnam later on in Cuba, and it was not at all sure as to which system was going to triumph. It now may seem absurd, but at that time it wasn't. And so a lot of effort was put into creating economies in which the poorer sections of the population were not left out to rot. The, the, the emergence of the neoliberal system and its acceleration coincided with the collapse of that whole world. The implosion of the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe, and even more importantly, in terms of the structure of the world market, the emergence of China as the most dynamic capitalist state with its own national variations on a global scale. And I think if you were to ask what is the most significant feature of the world in the 21st century, the answer would have to be the fact that the center of the world market has shifted eastwards. That is one of the most significant features of the century in which we live and how it will pan out and its future impact in the world is something it is very difficult to predict at the moment. So in this situation, to be passive, to give up hope, is in my view completely counterproductive. I think the period of passivity in the late 90s and the early years of uh, this century, I mean, I could, I could at least understand it. 
Now it's very difficult to understand. And so we need, we need new movements. And we need new type of organizations which have something to offer people. Because I'll tell you what happens when you don't have anything to offer. Two possibilities. One, apathy, and the second, the growth of the far right. Shrechko talked about it earlier at the conference, and it's correct that we have seen a big, big growth of the far right. I mean, in Greece it is frightening. However, the far right always rises. There is no exception here at all. Historically, <clears throat> when sections of an embattled and sometimes decaying state apparatus feel the need to encourage it, of course, they have popular support. One shouldn't underestimate that. But they also get support from the state. And that is true because sections of the state, like these people, irregulars, paras, people who are not part of the state but can be used by the state in order to do things that the state itself at this point in time cannot do or doesn't wish to do. The threat they represent at the moment, in my opinion, is not a threat of taking over state power. In no country are they anywhere near that. And, but they will be useful to some. On the other hand, the arguments, again, as uh, my colleague here pointed out a few days ago, <clears throat> the arguments the most intelligent extreme right groups are using are not so different from what the left of the le center left is saying. What are they saying? That the, st uh, the uh, corrupt politicians who are running our countries are letting us rot. Uh, if you listen to Marine Le Pen's interview or read Marine Le Pen's interview in the uh, New York Times, it's quite significant, actually. Oh, my God, I'm sorry. I should have turned this off. <laughs> I'm very sorry, I will just switch it off. Le Pen, maybe. <laughs> no, 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 it's not Le Pen. Uh, <clears throat> Marine Le Pen, if you read her New York Times interview, she is asked what would be your, you know, main demands. Do you know what she says? She she says, everything from which the French workers benefit should be owned by the state. I'm, I don't exaggerate. All our hospitals, our schools, water, all these should be owned by the state. I don't see why the state should make a profit from the basic needs of people. Well, we have been saying that for you know, many years now. And why do they say it? Because they know it strikes a chord with workers. And not just with workers, with the less privileged sections of society who may not be workers, technically speaking. And I said in Paris at, a, at, a, at an event, I said, you know, it's ironic that on a social and economic level, the uh, demands we have the far right, which is to the left of the center, whether it's the Socialist Party or Sarkozy's party. In Holland, it's not so dissimilar either. So they learn, and they're learning, and they're seeing what people want and what people need and trying to accommodate it. Of course, together with this comes the attack on immigrants. I mean, in Greece, as you know, we've seen small-scale pogroms harassment, intimidation of migrants, of the Roma, a huge, huge increase of Islamophobia all over Europe, especially after 9-11. So all this goes on, which the extreme right plays into uh, as well.
But recently, the effect of this, just to take the example of France, one of the core countries of Europe, the new leader of the Conservative Party who's been elected, the Sarkozy's party, Cope, Cope, he says very similar things. So when he was elected, Le Pen said, well, you know, we know why he's been elected, because he's been copying all our ideas. But I suggest to the people of France, if they want what he's saying, vote for the original. <laughs> and it, this is what I mean when I say that sections of the state apparatus, especially the secret police, the paramilitaries, the special police squads, are linked in with these people. And it begins to have an effect then on conservative and right-wing uh, political parties. And this is where the center-left is proved to be a disaster in one country after another. You know, you just have to look. I mean, look at PASOK. I'm actually, I wish they had all been wiped out politically. I really do. But that's the only way they learn given what happened to them. And if people mimic them elsewhere and behave like Pasok did in Greece and accept all the demands of the Troika and the bankers, it will happen elsewhere, and it is happening elsewhere. But it's no point in this happening unless something is done to create a political movement, a political coalition, which is non-sectarian and inclusive, to the left of these parties. And here I think we have to turn our gaze in the direction of South America. This is a continent which has largely been ignored by Europeans. The Europeans have been so immersed in self-contemplation because one of the ironies of globalization is that it makes people more provincial, not less, as we are seeing in country after country. And people have ignored what is going on in South America. What is it? It's effectively a combination of two things. A huge revolt against neoliberal globalization by mass social movements in country after country, and in many cases, not even self-organization of the poor, the poor peasants and workers and the unemployed. In some countries, it's been more organized than others. And I always remember the words which I watched with my own eyes when I was in South America on CNN, where the Peruvian peasants in Cusco, in the mountain region in Peru, were resisting electricity privatization. And they fought for three months against the military, by the way, and police units to resist it. And they were winning more and more support, and finally the government had to back down. It was defeated. Short of a genocide, they couldn't do anything. And I saw this CNN guy interviewing a Peruvian peasant. And the CNN guy was genuinely bewildered. And the first question he said to the Peruvian peasant, who is behind you? Are you people communists? And they said, no, we don't know what that is. No, we are not communists. And we are not shining path either. We are not sort of mad people. No. So he said, then why are you doing all this? And he said, the reason we are doing all this is because we are sure of one thing, that when the electricity is privatized, the prices will go up. We are sure of that, because we have followed what happens in other parts of the world. And if the prices of electricity go up, and he pointed to the villages behind him. He said, in these villages, which are with us and fighting, we will be forced to return to using oil lamps and candles again. And we don't want to do that. That's why we're resisting privatization. The guide couldn't have a follow-up question. 
Now, this level of organization uh, was amazing. And it happened in Bolivia, it happened in Venezuela, it happened in Peru, it happened in Argentina when the system collapsed, a system not totally unlike Greece now, where the elite had done for 10 or 15 years everything the Americans had asked them to, and the Troika, not the European Bank, but the World Bank, the IMF, and the U.S. Treasury Department. That was the Troika for South America. They did everything they, they had been asked to do, and the banking system imploded. They couldn't keep up. There was a run on the banks. Within the space of a fortnight, three different presidents fell. The whole, I, was, I went there soon afterwards, and at, still at that time, Buenos Aires, which is a huge city with millions of people in every single area of that city, you had assemblies of citizens meeting to discuss what to do in the next week in their area to make sure everyone had water, everyone had food, just self-organization from below without any political party taking charge of it. And the effects were dramatic. You had factories occupied by workers, producing goods, goods being used to trade with workers occupying other factories, etc., etc. It was a very inspiring example, all that. Uh, and then finally they elected a government, and that government did very similar things to what Syriza said it would do. They said, we, we are going to default, we can't pay the debt. It's a debt you organize with our banks and our elite. It's not in the interest of the Argentinian people. And so they pay, I think the agreement they finally reached, I can't remember, to pay two cents on every dollar or something like that, which was a nothing compared to what they owed. And slowly they began to get the economy working again. It took some time, but it did. And recently they took over an oil company back from the private sector and the whole European financial press went crazy and the Argentinians said we took this company over because they couldn't function anyway they were going to sell it to the Chinese so if the Chinese are going to buy it why shouldn't the Argentinian state buy it and we asked the Chinese what is the price you were going to offer and we've given them the same amount of money so just stop barking you've been paid so you have governments which can do that in Venezuela the ad social advances are quite incredible. You know, the, the um, oil, they have oil money. This oil money has not been used for the first time in the history of that country to do what? To do what most of the Arab states can't do, which is educate the entire population, free schooling, new universities are being built, Medical universities are being built, and it's the children of the poor, who, people who have never had any advantages in life, who go here. And so slowly, the sociology of that country is being changed. I, I've, I'm, you know, I, I've been there several times, and each time I go, the confidence of ordinary people is growing. Just this year I was there, <clears throat> before the elections, and what they were doing was public housing, because people like me have been criticizing them, saying, look, it's fine what you're doing, it's great, but public housing is not in a good situation, and there are two or three million people without houses and homes. And they said, yes, and now look what we are doing. In, Buenos, uh, in uh, Caracas, the country, the city is divided. In the eastern part of the city is where the rich live. Then slowly, as you move to the west, and then the western suburbs, it's the poor. The government said there are so many pl places in the city where their land has been bought by property speculators waiting for the prices to go up, and then they will sell the land and build. So the government ch 
put out a law saying that all the land in Caracas which has not been built within the next six months, the government will forcibly requisition it, pay them the market prices of today, and build public housing. This has been done. Oh, huge workers' apartments are going up, and I saw one of them, and I tell you honestly, if uh, European workers uh, or unemployed people or homeless people would offer, were offered that, they would be voting for these parties forever. So a lot of things like this are happening, and this is why it's very interesting. I, when Alex Cipros was asked, who do you admire the most in this world? He said Hugo Chavez of Venezuela. Well, of course, this was big news in South America. But here it was used to attack him endlessly because it's the way they had been attacking Chavez in virtually the entire European press for doing what he did because this was not permissible. But he showed he didn't, they didn't care whether it was permissible or not through mass mobilizations, building parties, building grassroots organizations, they did it. They did it. And it's very interesting. About um, four, five, six years ago, Chavez came for an oil conference in Doha, and they interviewed him on Al Jazeera uh, with Arab voiceover. And after he spoke, they interviewed him for 40 minutes. He just described what they were doing in Venezuela with the oil money. And afterwards, an Al Jazeera producer told me, we have never had so many emails in our history before. Not on Palestine, not on Iraq, not on anything else, but after this guy spoke. And we had to hire special people to answer these emails. So I said, what did the emails ask? They said the emails asked in some shape or form one question, when will the Arabs produce a Chavez? Because that's what the guy was talking about, helping the poor, helping the underprivileged, questions which are hardly ever raised in the Arab world. They're not used to it, and they're quite surprised and very pleased too that these questions were being raised. So it's not a question that there are no alternatives at all. There are transitional alternatives. That's what I would call these alternatives, transitional alternatives which break the pattern and break the, the structure of the neoliberal system and politicize and increase the class consciousness and the political consciousness of the population. That is the big difference between Europe and uh, South America. Because a related point is this, which I ask myself often, which is that despite all these mass mobilizations in Greece, in Spain, in Italy, how come that the gut reaction of those involved in these actions was not, why don't we take a city? Or in the Arab world, and during the Egyptian mass mobilizations and uprisings. In Alexandria, in Egypt, they had a city for three days without any military force or police force at all. Yet no one but no one said, this was not the spontaneous consciousness of the masses in Alexandria, no one said, why don't we take this city and have a workers' council or a popular council or whatever running it? It's because that notion, I'm afraid, did not exist. Could have happened in Thessaloniki last year when there's a huge general strike. It doesn't happen. And I think the reason it doesn't happen is that people don't think they can achieve. I mean, I'm saying in these particular instances, I'm not saying it'll never happen. But I'm saying if you look at this, it's a very interesting uh, uh, pattern. So. This is the big difference, if you like, between the 60s and 70s of the last century and the present world. And I would describe it as this, that in the 60s and 70s of the last century, a world divided by cold wars, there was no single economic force field, but there was if not a single 
a fairly closely related force field of effective revolutionary and radical ideas which stretched across the time zones of the contemporary world. Today that's virtually been replaced. You have a single economic force field which stretches across the time zones, but you don't have an effective political force, radical, revolutionaries, whatever you want to call it, force field. That is what has changed, and that is something which uh, we have to pay attention to. And what I'm saying is that the objective and subjective seeds of turmoil have switched sides. And this is something we have to uh, encounter. Now, one outcome of the Chinese dominance as the single most important economic power today in a world with huge growth rates still, despite the crisis, what is going to be the outcome of this? Whereas in the United States you have seen a massive, deliberately orchestrated decline of the labor movement, industrial workers, as in Britain, as in other parts of Europe. In China it's exactly the opposite. The largest single proletarian force today exists in China. And sometimes when I'm talking on American campuses and they say, you know, you talk about the labor movement, but what, where, well, where is the American working class? And I half-jokingly reply, the American working class is temporarily working in China, <laughs> living in China. Because that is where the bulk of the stuff is coming from. And in China now, we are getting reports regularly not of huge nationwide uprisings, factory, but we are getting reports of factory occupations. We are getting reports of peasant uprisings, of, un of political unrest, of people demanding democratic rights, because they're saying if we're going to be ruled like this, we must be able to have some input into this society. <clears throat> so there is, there is a, a turmoil there. In Eastern Europe, I was in, in, in uh, Czech, the Czech Republic the uh, other day, uh, and some young people told me that uh, women, that they said our cousins who are working in these factories, foreign factories from Japan or Tesco's and these things, are working in much, much worse conditions than existed in the old days. Our mothers and grandmothers tell us that. So I said, tell me. They said, we'll give you a single example which will surprise you. I said, they said in the Japanese factories in the Czech Republic, women are not allowed to go to the toilet except when the bell rings. It creates a huge problem. And women who are menstruating have to come and inform the foreman that they are menstruating and they're given a red badge to put on. And then they can go just by informing the foreman. I mean, just imagine. I mean, the shock and horror this would have created were it under a system different from capitalism if this sort of behavior was going on. So the level of exploitation in many of these Eastern European countries has shot up, actually. And it's, it's, something, uh, it's something to take, take account of. Now, I want to make one other point in relation to this, and then I want to make a few remarks about Cyprus with your permission. First, if the welfare state is to survive, then the state has to find a source of income which is not exclusively based on taxes. Because taxes coming from even the richest segments of society or the large corporations, if they could be forced to disgorge the money they owe the state, are not enough, not enough to create, to sustain, to strengthen a social welfare state. No, it can't be done. So taxes alone are not sufficient. Not even punitive taxes or one-off taxes uh, uh, as was said. I think, you know, here one has to say that the state needs to own its own capital and its own land. 
and to use this to create structures which benefit the majority of its citizens. I can't, I personally can't see any other way. And of course to say this now is such a heresy, it never used to be, but it's now a complete heresy uh, that it's, it's not accepted. It's impossible, they say, but you know we were told many things were impossible. I would say that the permanent expansion of fictitious capital is also impossible. But they carry on repeating it, and that's one of the features of this crisis, is that they are carrying on just like before. They, don't, they haven't learned any lessons. Tiny bit of regulation, more regulation, but not seriously so. And that is a, a huge disaster, and it's not going to work. If I can now just say something about Cyprus. It is symbolic, this island, of a world, a Western world largely, without any norms. If you want to discuss the violation of human rights, the violation of constitutional rights, the violation of democratic rights, it has been done in Cyprus on the say-so of the Western powers, initially Britain, and after that, the United States. Just think, as a counterfactual, that if after the First World War, 19, you know, 18, 19, 20 even, the victorious powers had decided to do what they did with uh, roads, an Italian colony saying it's part of Greece. Suppose they had done that. Well, the whole history of this island would have been different, without any doubt at all. But they didn't do it. And in fact, British, British colonialism hung on, hung on tenaciously to Cyprus, not even permitting this island the most basic rudimentary rights of self-government that they had permitted certainly all their former uh, European originated colonies, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, that they had permitted India in 1937, that they had even permitted parts of Africa gently. Cyprus was not permitted that control and they were very open about it. Uh, General Harding, I think it was the English general who came here in the 50s and he said, look, he told the British government, if you don't allow the Cypriots self-government, the only way to rule them will be like ruling them like an iron dictatorship. And the government in London replied, so be it. But why? because it was caught up in a lot of strategic thinking, especially after the Second World War. Uh, it was caught up with the, the huge interventions that the British made in Greece to intervene in the Civil War, not unlike the German and Italian intervention in the Spanish Civil War. This was the British and American intervention in the Greek Civil War to make sure that the right won. The victory of the right <clears throat> in the Greek Civil War made the, made the Greek ruling parties, you know, the um, Karamanlis and people total stooges, vassals of the Western powers. They were not in a position. All their talk of uh, Hellenism and Greek nationalism disappeared. Anti-communism was the main motivation of the post-war Greek governments imposed on Greece by the Western powers. And so they did what they were asked. Cyprus was not a key, a key priority for them. The Turks, who were not a dependent power, were far more active, wrongly in most cases, of course, by backing up and creating a situation, helping to engender ethnic divides, but the principal responsibility for that, I would say, lies with the British.
that having failed to permit self to autonomy and self-determination to Cyprus, they then encourage a divide and rule tactic, which they do everywhere, the most recent example of which is in Iraq, a country where, the, honestly, uh, all the Iraqis I knew, friends, many of whom were killed by uh, the dictator, you never, the one question you never asked, are you Sunni or Shia? You just never asked that because it didn't occur to you to ask it or occur to them to say it. But this is now, with the occupation of Iraq, became a huge thing. And we know perfectly well that the British did the same business uh, here. It's not that they were complete, that the Turks were total innocence in this, or that they had no cause, because Grivas and more particularly Eoka B were very active in what they were doing as well, attacking Turkish villages and wiping them, them out. But by that time, already, the tensions had become extremely strong. So the, the history goes back a long way. I mean, it is bizarre to me that Cyprus, a member of the European Union, has military bases of another European Union country here. Why? Why do the governments accept it? Why didn't the Cypriot government appeal to the European Union saying thank you very much, it's very kind of you to keep British bases here, but we don't want them. And we don't want any foreign military bases here at all, either Greek or Turkish or British. Out with them. Let's have proper independence. Of course, the situation, as you know better than me, has gone way beyond that. But the attempts, the so-called Annan plans, Kofi Annan, now the only thing this guy will be remembered for is being the front man for American-British plans to further fuck up Cyprus. Annan what? One, two, three, four, five. Ridiculous plans who had one aim to get Turkey into the EU <clears throat> and none other. Cypriots were playthings, Turkish and Greek Cypriots. And so the result is the mess we have now. And the, the situation, this is, you know, this conference is called roadblocks. This here is a huge roadblock. And, you know, one could ask, just to be a bit provocative, what if the Kurds in Turkey were to ask Turkey to be divided in the same way as Cyprus is on the similar basis of population uh, differences? Kurds are 18 or 19 percent of the Turkish population. What if the Anand, uh, Kofi Annan plan was to be, which diplomat would have the guts to fly to Istanbul with that and say to Sultan Erdogan, here we have a plan for Turkey. You have been killing and brutalizing your Kurds for a long, long time. They are 18% of the population. Give them 50% of your coastline. A Senate where they have equal power. And 25% reserved seats in the lower house. Would the Turks accept it? Like hell they would. So it's not so different. Not so different. I mean, you know, many of us who follow to, uh, Cypriot politics from outside were hoping that effectively Cyprus's membership of the European Union, a huge, massive uh, increase in growth rates, good levels of unemployment, good social services, the gradual easing of borders, the fact that 10% of the Turkish Cypriots were coming across the Green Line to work, could slowly have created a basis for reuniting the island. But that too now has been blocked by the economic crisis. But it, something like that has to be done. It's extremely positive that Turkish Cypriots uh, born here and historically who belong here have been registering in, to become 
to have their identity cards because being a member of the European Union does give you some advantages. And that's a good thing. But how far this process will go on, I don't know. The one thing I'm absolutely sure about is no Western power, certainly not the so-called guarantor powers or the United Nations, which is an instrument largely of the United States, not exclusively, but largely of the United States, are going to be able to do anything. So change, when it comes, and I hope it will come, has to come from within, uh, uh, from, the, from, from, from the inside. But when it will come, I don't know. But it should come because the situation here is an anomaly. It's very depressing for me to cross the green line and go and see a city like Famagusta, which is the bulk of it is deserted. It's sort of quite upsetting. You know, you feel depressed. You feel there's something wrong. It, it shouldn't be like this. So I don't want to end on that depressing note because, you know, people are fighting and engaging in different parts of the world, but something has to be done. And I think that we are now beyond the times where be remaining passive and just simply tending to one's own garden is sufficient to carry on with everyday life. It isn't. It really isn't. Something should shift, something should change, and many of you growing up now in, in this region have to do it. Follow the South American example, follow some of the good examples which are um, emerging in, in, uh, in, in Europe itself. As for the European Union, it is now a top-heavy, undemocratic institution where the European Parliament basically has no powers at all. You know, as a political activist for a long, long time, I was never in favor of just opposing the European Union because we thought it could be a good thing to unite people from below. You know, to have collaboration of workers' organizations, political parties. And it could be if it were a different kind of Europe. But the Europe we have today is effectively, as we see before us, a dictatorial banker's Europe run by the elites, and it can't carry on like this indefinitely if we are talking about the future of Europe. Because given the scale of the crisis, we don't yet know what's going to happen to five or six European countries uh, at least. And within the German elite, there is open talk of reverting to a core Europe. In Britain, opinion polls are showing that 50 to 60 percent of the population would vote to get out of Europe. The British government is not moved by that. The Americans are not in favor of this. And what the British do does depend a lot on what the Americans want. But the, the tectonic plates are beginning to shake a tiny bit. They have not shifted, but they are shaking. There are, you can see the tremors in Europe because the, the writing is on the wall. I mean, a million workers and supporters marched in Barcelona not so long ago, demanding independence, as I discussed earlier. That is not a solution. The solution is not going to come from the top within Europe because these politicians have not changed at all. Because they have no real opposition, an opposition with a political alternative from below, they think they can get away with it forever. And when they get what is the beginning of a political alternative, an opposition from below, like in Greece, they unite to crush it. So, but that doesn't mean we give up. Obviously, but it means that one can't have too many illusions in the leadership of the EU today being able to solve the crisis given its magnitude and scale. I'll stop there. Thank you. So I ask you to stay a bit longer with us. We still have 
half an hour for discussion. I already see a question there on the right side. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I, there, there's one word that came uh, to Could my Could you speak into the mic? Yeah. There's, there's one word that came to my mind, which you spoke uh, uh, about without saying it. It's individualism in Europe. And so this, I, I feel that this word is really Im important into how do we move beyond that and where do you trace how do you trace it back to where where did it start and therefore how can one move beyond individualism to go to the example of South America and China and and other examples and uh, I also have another comment uh, well actually uh, I have a comment about um, uh, Arab states uh, you you've mentioned that uh, I mean, uh, there's uh, why why do uh, Arabs um, don't have the the socialist uh, approach or the approach in where they can actually look at their people and uh, have social housing and uh, medical care and actually this exists in or at least existed in uh, in Iraq and Syria, but of course for other means for you know to mask dictatorship uh, uh, maintenance and other. But uh, I, I think it's important to to mention that as well because it did exist and no longer exists. So that's uh, I'll stop there. Uh, if I understood you correct, you said given the scale of individualism <clears throat> that exists in the world today, how can we push it back? Well, look, um, you know this argument was also used in the 50s, which were quite passive years uh, in in some ways. But I think that what changes people's consciousness is not on the level of individuals. You know, what changes consciousness is when large numbers of people are affected by exactly the same problem or the same illness or the same disease, and then they can surmount their individualism because it's no longer, you know, being an individual just and uh, atomized isn't going to solve any problem at all. And this is what we are seeing now in many parts of Europe, is these large assemblies that are taking place, shows that people are feeling that they cannot simply function as individuals. They have to unite with other individuals who share similar interests and uh, see if something can be done. In the Arab world, yes, you're right, these regimes had those privileges uh, for ordinary people. And however brutal the tyranny of Saddam Hussein was, and you know, I was certainly a strong opponent of his, the th other thing which you shouldn't forget, Iraq had the best, highest level of education for women, not just women, but including women, the best level of employment for women in virtually every sector of the region, it was not a country riven by uh, uh, ethnicity and ethnic divides and tribalism. It had a health service which functioned after the Gulf War and the havoc wreaked by the Gulf War uh, when 50,000 Iraqi soldiers were killed in a turkey shoot by the Americans when they were retreating. Ordinary people, not the regime, ordinary people. Uh, it took three months for that government to have things functioning again as best they could. The American occupiers and their chums in Iraq since 2003 have still not been able to get that society working again. And if you compare on that, and it's not that oppression has ceased either. You know, people are still arrested, people are still beaten up. The big difference between Saddam's Iraq and this Iraq is that now you still have quite a dictatorial regime with Western backing, but you also have a tiny layer of people who have become the new millionaires and billionaires, who have got the contracts to rebuild what was destroyed at war, what Naomi Klein, dear friend, calls catastrophe capitalism. You destroy a country and then you rebuild it and most of the things go to you. So that is, that is the difference. And in Syria it's the same. That I'm completely opposed to Assad. I'm not in favor of family rule. I think it's disgraceful. 
that uh, Father Asad appointed his young son to run the country, he would have been better occupied doing whatever he does, a dentist or whatever he is. But in any case, and he should have gone, taken the message when there were good people on the streets, you know, including many friends of mine who were offering him a chance to go. All we want is con negotiations, to negotiate. No one wants to touch you or kill you. Let us meet, have our own constitution, allow others to function. You don't do it, and now you have exactly what is, what is going on uh, in Syria. Many good people involved with the uprising, but increasingly now religious groups of different uh, types uh, there being backed by other governments, so we will, it's a mess. I hope it doesn't reach the same level as, um, of mess that exists in Libya where it's liberated by NATO and a few weeks later then, or months later they're assassinating the American ambassador having failed to get the British one. So <clears throat> it's, it's a complete mess that they create and the worst thing they did in Iraq was basically to destroy the social infrastructure of that country. You know, after the Second World War, just to put it in perspective, 70% of the apparatus of fascist Italy was kept in place by the West, the Americans, because they needed it to fight the communists. 50% in Germany, 60 to 70% in Japan. They kept that to also to preserve stability. In Iraq, they totally dismantled the Iraqi army, creating mayhem and effectively laying the basis for ethnic cleansings, which happened in Baghdad, which is unrecognizable, my friends tell me, from what that city used to be, despite Saddam. So that is the world we, we, we live in today. Uh, and, you know, the problem doesn't go away. And the regime in Egypt, good, it's a democratic elected government. I'm all in favor of that. But that is not sufficient because we have elected governments in Europe too. It's what they do. And they are like the Christian Democrats, socially conservative. What are they going to do? At the moment, they are not breaking with neoliberalism at all. They've said that, like Erdogan in Turkey, part and parcel of the neoliberal system. That's what I meant that the economic force field is the same. The big difference, of course, in Egypt is that the people who rose and got rid of the dictator are still there. They have not been crushed. And that gives them a level of political consciousness which doesn't exist to that extent in other parts of the world because they've won a victory in Tunisia and in Egypt. And that is extremely and not as individuals, they won the victory as a collective. So we have another question on the left and another one. Um, hello. First of all, uh, I want to thank you about uh, your hopeful uh, lecture. And um, I'm quite surprised that you know so much about Cyprus. You made the case better than some Greek politicians that we have done. So. Um, I would like to uh, expand a bit on the issue of migrants in Europe. Um, you haven't talked about this. Um, I, I don't know if it, it was because you didn't have time, but Cyprus is one of the first countries that migrants come, uh, either from Iraq or from Syria now. And uh, it seems to me that the only, um, the only concern of Europe and Cyprus government as well is how to minimize uh, benefits or minimize um, the inclusion of these people into societies. And this reflects also the, policy, the policies of Europe against migrants, for, 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 for Europe and, and, and all this. I, I don't know if I formulated a, a question about that. But thank you. Well, look, <clears throat> the, the question of migrants is a huge one. Let me take Iraq again. Up to a million people died during the occupation. Five million orphans. Three and a half million people wounded. Four million plus refugees, mainly in the neighboring countries. Jordan, Syria, Lebanon. What about the Iraqi refugees in, in, in Syria now? I think about them. Where are they going to go? 
But every time countries are dislocated through military invasions or structural adjustment programs imposed by the IMF, and it's a different hands doing similar things, you have people who want to get out, not because they want to leave, but because there is no other solution. And in a world where we are told there's a free movement of capital, a free movement of this, a free movement of that, that's what the WTO rules say, there is no free movement of labor unless you're in the European Union. And even in the European Union, some of the most racist, not racist in terms of skin color, attacks which happen now in parts of Britain are against the Polish workers who are coming because their economies have been wrecked. So it isn't, you know, it's where it's racism it becomes easier, of course, but I'm saying that there is this hostility to migrants. Uh, <clears throat> which always comes up at times of crisis. In France, Sarkozy was uh, deporting the Roma. Why? You know, not even for the right, it has any material basis at all. It's just to heighten the temperature. The socialists get elected. And the interior minister, Manuel Valles, whose own parents were Spanish Civil War veterans and got refuge in France of the Popular Front, period, he has now started attacking the Roma people as well. If Sarkozy can, and we can. So naturally the extreme right politicians sit back and just clap hands saying, thank you guys, you're making it easier for us. And this has been true uh, historically, but I will say something else to you, that the way in which the massacre by the fascists of Jews during the Second World War is being used, I mean, look, it was one of the worst massacres in, in modern history, there's no question about that. And the, and the fact that it was systematically carried out in Germany, later in Italy, and in France. Uh, I mean, of course, it's a horrific crime. But the way it's being used is in two ways. It's being used by the Israelis to get a permanent blank check to do whatever they want to do to the Palestinians. But the Palestinians weren't responsible for this genocide. It was Europeans or a particular faction of the European ruling elites. But the Palestinians have become the indirect victims of the European genocide of the Jews. And the Europeans who are now feeling guilty about what they did and giving Israel carte blanche to do whatever it wants and giving it money and this, that and the other don't think about the Palestinians as human beings. Just doesn't matter. Second way the Holocaust is being used, which I think there's, it's defective. Look, when you say a crime is wrong, what are you pointing out to? You have to teach people what are the origins of that crime. The origins of that crime are a widespread anti-Semitism that existed in Christian European societies for a long, long time. That is the basis on which the Nazis could mount their Holocaust or Judeocide. If you just point to it as a unique occurrence, you downplay other massacres that have taken place, like Belgian colonialism wiping out between 10 and 12 uh, million Congolese in the last years of the 19th and the early years of the 20th. Just as horrific, just as horrific. And if you're teaching kids about this, you have to then teach them how this emerged. And I would, I, I did something some years ago because I was curious. And the arguments that were being used against the Jews in the 20s and 30s and 40s and even the 50s of the last century, in some cases, the words are exactly the same as are being used against the Muslim population of Europe today. They are not like us, they have funny habits, they have funny dietary arrangements, they wear strange things on their heads, 
They wear funny clothes, they are the other, they will never settle in, they will never assimilate, they will never do this, uh, and so we keep them at bay. We push them. Now, especially in places where there were mixed populations before they were manipulated, we know that that is wrong, of course. History shows us it's wrong. You know, if you go back a long time ago, to the uh, 15th and 16th centuries in European history, where you had large mixed populations in the whole Iberian Peninsula, in southern Italy, in parts of France, where Christian Muslims and Jews did live together. Till the Catholic Church went on the offensive and created the new European identity, which was effectively a Christian identity. That is the history. And under the Ottoman rule, uh, you know, horrible things happened, as we know, as well. But in large swathes of Ottoman lands, people did manage to live together. It's not that they don't know each other. In Northern Europe, of course, it's different. So there's no excuse for treating people uh, uh, in this way at all. And, you know, one has to point this out, that when young kids are taught and taken to Auschwitz, etc., good, let them learn. But let them also learn how this happens. What are the roots of this and why it should be challenged so that perhaps they will understand it in relation to other people against whom similar, lang uh, similar language is being used today? Sorry, the what? The important thing is that you want to change it. Do you? Yes or no? You're not sure. Okay. Then, you know, where there is a will, there is a way. You will find a way. You look quite young to me. <clears throat> there are years, good years ahead in your life. So don't give up so easily. And, you know, there are no magic solutions. It's the way change comes is when people organize. That has been the, one of the lessons of world history for many thousands of years, going back to primitive rebels. Um, it's, that is the only way into slave uprisings. It is, it's, change comes when people get together and organize and win other people over to their ideas. And whatever you want to call it, and different people called it different things, but that's how change happens. That's the history of all the revolutions that we have witnessed, you know, since the English Revolution of the 17th century, when the ideology they used was a Puritan Protestant religious ideology, but effectively, even though they didn't know it, they were making big changes in that society. We are now more aware. We can do it more consciously. But that is what, what, what uh, needs to be done. It cannot be done by ignoring politics. That's one thing I just want to tell you. If you ignore politics, you're finished. If you say that, you know, we want to steer clear of politics, or we're not interested in, uh, in power, or that phrase which uh, uh, you can change the world without taking power, excuse me. No. You will change nothing without attempting to take power, without being involved and engaged in, in politics. And people do it differently. Different generations come to it differently. But that's, that's, uh, that's how you do it. So we have time for one or two questions more. There is one. I'll Shout it out, man. Go on. Okay. Um, one of the examples you gave was Chavez. And I come from a country that people there love Chavez for his popular and, um, movement towards the Arab world and uh, Palestine, and etc. Uh, 
But my question is like, with his socialist approach, he's also, it's about the figure, Chavez himself, no? And in the 60s also, and the 50s, we had Abdel Nasser in Egypt, where his, the socialist movement and the socialist revolution was around that one figure that kept winning the elections with 99.9%. .9%. My question is, like there's, in, in Latin America, there's are, there are other examples of like Brazil. I don't know, uh, how can you comment on Brazil as, as a socialist movement that's winning through elections, which might also lose, you know, it's always, always close to lose you know, the, 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 the workers party um, that's winning now, might lose. And then, you know, it, the, the whole socialist approach with, with this new Brazil, with the Brazilian government might lose to and we come back to the right wing. My question is like, to keep left wing winning, it has to be a dictatorship too, no? You like what, to sorry, what's the last thing? For, for Chavez to, to remain in power, the, the, for the right, the extreme right, left wing to stay in power, Chavez has to stay in power too. And that's a problem of dictatorship, or it leads to that as well. I mean, is Chavez a good example for the change or it's, it's a problematic example. Look, the one thing you have to understand is that the experience which we have seen in the 20th century of socialism equated, or communism, whatever you want to call it, equated with dictatorships, one-party states, crushing of political opponents physically, exterminations in country after country has not been good for the movement. It's been a bad example. That is something we should never even think of going back to. And people don't want that. One reason why the regimes and system was so discredited. And the tragedy is that because the Russians did it for contingent reasons, but you know, they didn't need to carry it on after 1917, meant that every anti-imperialist nationalist country where upheavals happened or power was taken felt that they had to use that same model, which is Nasser's mistake. 99.9% .9 voting for me, probably 70% would have voted for him because he was loved. But this insistence on not permitting opposition is disastrous as we, we see today. The South American examples are very different. They are large social movements which create new political forces and parties who win elections democratically, use the system to come to power. The question now is, which you're posing is, but how can they stay in power? And I think, A, obviously individuals can't stay in power because the laws of biology affect them like everyone else. Uh, but they have to create movements which they hope will stay in power. They cannot do it at the moment in any way by force. And none of these governments, this is why I, I refer to them sometimes when people say what, a, what would be a scientific characterization of them, I say left-wing social democracy sui generis of its own particular type. That's what they are. That is all we've got at the moment. We've got nothing else. Uh, and Chavez has now won elections, God knows how many times. It's not that they are 90% elections at all, but he wins them. The opposition is very strong, backed by the United States. They haven't been able to defeat him. When they organized a coup d'etat against him, within 48 hours that coup d'etat had been reversed. Why? Because ordinary soldiers went to their officers and said, we're not going to back you guys. You will have mutinies in all the military bases because the soldiers are with him. And then the masses poured down from the slums and they, they retreated. They, they didn't kill him. Had they killed him, you would have had a civil war in Venezuela without any doubt. And they knew that. So these people are tackling in new global conditions how to do certain things. Brazil is a different example because Brazil, the Workers Party came to power but kept the neoliberal system. So it's not like these other countries, not like Bolivia. On the other hand, where Brazil is extremely important is that they refuse to be used 
as an instrument of American foreign policy. They made that very clear. And recently, when the opposition guy to Chavez in the okay. last elections in Venezuela stood up and said, there are two ways in Latin America, the line of the economist in the financial time. There are two ways forward in South America. One is the way of Chavez, which is extremist, socialist, anti-capitalist. The other is way of Lula. I am with Lula. This is the opposition candidate in Venezuela. Do you know what Lula did? He said, Chavez and I may not agree with everything, but his victory is important for the progress of our entire continent. That you never had before. A continent, not every country, but many of the countries united. And you know, sometimes when I think of Europe, and because I am hostile to sort of crude forms of nationalism, I, and because the European Union isn't working, I sometimes think that it's better to organize entities within Europe which have something in common uh, and work as a collective, not on every single issue, not give up national sovereignty, not that it exists all to the, all that extent, but, but to work collectively <clears throat> with other countries. I mean, there was a sort of good idea once in the 20s and 30s of the last century of a Balkan Federation. Well, w why not think about a Balkan Confederation? of Balkan states, which would have more power than Croatia on its own, or Cyprus on its own, or Greece on its own. And that, I think, would be a creative way of thinking <clears throat> in terms of learning something from South America, or the Mediterranean states, you know, if they decided to work together, would weaken the control of the Americans and the European elites over what happens in these countries. So we have to sort of learn to think uh, a bit differently now. So my suggestion is we end with this conclusion and then we move to the buffet where we can continue the discussion. Uh, but before we thank Tarek with a big applause, I would like to invite Ellen Black to just close the conference because this is the closing of the three days conference, although the exhibition will still go on. So please, if you can come here and please, if you can stay for a few minutes more. Thank you very much and thank you so much, Tari and Shvechko. There are so many people to thank. Um, and I feel that I've been thanking people all the time, but um, it's been a wonderful project. It certainly has been a project that was full of roadblocks, but this is absolutely wonderful way to finish it. So I thank you very much for your support as well. Thanks.